Okay, guys, let's get started. Uh, good morning. Um, we're going to go over supermarket refrigeration systems. So I've got control of the mute for the microphones. So um, I will uh, I will unmute you guys as I have sections where we can have a question and answer. So um, anyway, we'll get started. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about parallel rack systems. Um, and then I'm going to flip it over to if you guys have ever worked on SR systems or EnviroGuard systems, um, we're gonna we're gonna pull up that diagram and we're gonna have uh, Scott Marco join us and and kind of run down since he was one of the the fathers for uh, designing that system. So we're gonna we're gonna run that down today too. So if you guys have ever dealt with an SR system in a in a Costco, um, it's something that guys struggle on on rack systems. So we're going to talk about that, kind of how they're set up and what they're looking for. So we'll, we'll touch on that about halfway through the class. So parallel rack systems, um, we'll be, we're able to control multiple temperatures. Uh, there's multiple compressors that stage. So they, they use common refrigerants and oils. <clears throat> here's, a, here's kind of a picture of a, a parallel rack system. We've got bits of compressors on there. This is the back side of the rack that we're looking at. So you got your suction lines or your circuits for multiple cases. You've got your uh, EPRs that determine case temperatures. Um, you've got your common suction header there that um, all the compressors draw from. You've got your common discharge header. Your common liquid line and your and your receiver. So and right there, your what you see right here. Can you guys? Let me unmute you. See it? You can't see it. You can't see it. You can't see it. Can you see it now? Can you guys see that? I can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Could you see it before? Yeah. Yeah, I could. Okay. All righty. So can you guys see my cursor on the screen there as well? Yeah. Okay. So what you have here, that's your that's your filter dryer section there. That's a core, shell and core filter dryer. So um you guys have any questions on what you're looking at right here? Go. So this is the front side of that rack that we were just looking at, or not the one that we were looking at, but this is the front side of a rack. We got the three styles that we most current, um, often see in the stores. We got a Bitzer here. Uh, that's that's a Copeland in the middle, and then a Carlisle. So those are, you know, I'm trying to think if we see much more than those, but that's probably 95% of the time what we're going to see on our rack systems. It's usually what they spec. So you've got your, uh, you can see the bottom half of that controller. It's an older, uh, I think that's an E1 actually. Anyway, so I think I've only seen one of those in the field, but usually you see an E2 or microthermal control. Uh, Dan Foss, Novar, a couple of different things, different um, styles there. There's your Bitzer and your Copeland and your Carlisle. So you got your oil separator. Uh, again, because they're pulling from a common oil system, that oil separ separator, it has the discharge line that goes into the separator. The separator separates the oil from the discharge gas. So, and then fills this separate, this reservoir with oil. So usually this style with the side glasses right on the, the separator is a, is a high pressure oil system like a turbo shed. So um, two, two separate types of oil systems that you'll find is um, you'll have your um, <clears throat> high pressure and your low pressure. So with your high pressure style, you'll see like a on downstream from the um, oil line, you'll see what looks like a TXV. To for your pressure drop on a low pressure, it uses a float style and a, 
a, a pressure regulating valve on the top of the, the um, oil reservoir to help regulate that pressure. Is there any, is there any questions? So you see your pressure controls there on the front, your high side and your low side pressure controls. So what best, pra best practices, guys, um, what are you guys seeing mostly in the field as far as these, these hoses being used? We're seeing a lot of armored cap tubes and a lot of those yellow pressure hoses now. Um, what are you guys seeing out there? Ow. Not all at once. That's what we're seeing. Mostly the armored cap tubes is what we're seeing. All right. I got a question for you. So on these armored cap tubes, um, on our old cap tubes, we put a bit of silicone across the armored cap or the, the old cap tube style so to keep it from vibrating or, or breaking the copper from vibration off the compressor from the harmonics in the rack. I still like to put a, a bead of clear silicone across that armor cap tube too to eliminate that vibration. Are you guys doing that as common practice? Because I haven't, I've been out walking stores this week and I haven't seen a lot of that. We just need to get back into practice of it in St. George. Um, it looks like it kind of got neglected for a long time. Yeah, let's try and do that. So there's two reasons why I like that. It keeps them separated and, and that, that silicone acts is almost like an absorbent. It absorbs the vibrations a lot better and keeps the cap tube from rubbing against it, um, each other or the MC cable uh, on the controls. So here's, a, here's a basic diagram. Sorry, I'm gonna mute you guys because some of you can hear at a 7-Eleven. <clears throat> so the uh, refrigerant comes in from the cases on the suction header. So depending on the rack controller and the PID it has, of how it stages those compressors um, it, and the, the capacity is how that ramps up those compressors based on the pr suction pressure coming in on that header. So discharges out on a common discharge, goes through the separator up to, and then up to the condenser. The oil separator gathers the oil and then sends it to the oil floats. So those floats are what controls how much, these floats right here are, are what controls how much oil is allowed into each compressor at any given time. So it comes back down from the condenser uh, as liquid goes in the receiver and then through the filter dryer and out through and then side glass and out to the cases to feed all your cases. So one thing they don't have on here is a mechanical subcooler, but usually we would see that on the outlet side of that or branched off of that filter dryer as well. So um, on the liquid side, on the, on the uh, outlet side of the receiver. <clears throat> Yeah, Pepsi was out here. You guys have any questions on that? I got a question. If you go back to the last slide, with those, um, hey, can you guys mute your phones, please? If you're not talking. So, I made it worth your time. Thank you. <laughs> I cleaned off all that the adhesive on on your guys' touch pads and stuff. Yeah. Got, got it all cleaned up. Gosh, thank you. Okay, Julian. You there? <laughs> yeah. So those uh, the oil. What did you call them? Not the. Uh, let me see. Let me draw these. This guy right here. The separator. Yeah. You said uh, it's an adjustable, or is it fixed to allow the the oil into the compressor, or? It, you can adjust them. So um, most. So what you want to see on a compressor is no less than a third, and no more than three three quarters. Or I'm sorry, a quarter, or, and no more than three quarter full. You want to you want to try and hang out at that half point, and that's with it running. Gotcha. Now, where would you make the adjustment if necessary? If you needed to make an adjustment on one, there's a nut. Things? There's a nut on the top with the with the service valve um, stem where you can make an adjustment to those oil loads. Gotcha. So, and you, it's just like anything else, like on a, on a supermarket system, you want to make your adjustments very small and and slow, and watch what it does. 
So very too often when we're making finite adjustments to these systems, guys get on it and they get on it too fast and too hard and then they're chasing it for hours. So make sure if you do adjust an oil float that you understand what you're doing first and foremost. And then when you do make those adjustments that you try to, um, you know, make your adjustment and watch it for about, you know, 10 minutes. So the oil will flow in there the compressor will run. Obviously, as you make your adjustments, make sure your compressor's running. So if you guys see while we're talking about oil, if you're pulling foam off the top of your oil, that's, that's liquid in your refrigerator, in your oil. So you need to make sure that if you see a foam inside glass or, you know, if it's, it, it might foam a little bit on startup if it's been sitting, but if it continues to foam, you need to start checking what, what circuits coming back too hard. Meaning how one of your circuits on that suction header are coming back too rich with liquid and it's, and it's flooding the compressor. Make sense. Is that it, Julian? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's it, man. Thank you. You bet. So, and if you guys can mute your, uh, mute your phones, I can unmute you, but it's just causing a lot of noise here on this end. So. Uh, hey, Jim, can you hear me? Yeah. The uh, one thing to kind of mention on the, the old float style oil level controls, uh, it may not be common knowledge anymore, but uh, if you do back that out too far, that float will actually fall off and then you're in a, a much bigger project. So you never want to back those out too far. Yeah, that's good with anything. I mean, guys, I mean, you can keep spinning spinning a TXV stem on uh, round and round. So anytime you're making adjustments, again, rule of thumb is if you're adjusting an oil flow, honestly, first thing you guys should do when you're dealing with oil systems, and I guess we'll just get into oil systems. I was going to talk about them quite a bit, but when you guys are getting on oil systems, the first thing you want to do is, you know, check your oil, check, check the aesthetic levels of your oil, check the color of your oil. Oil should be a nice maple maple syrup light brown it shouldn't be a dark a dark brown or a black so you guys should you know valve off and, and check your screens there's three screens that you should be checking on most of these compressors there's your pickup screen in your crankcase that's where most of your debris picks up for, for your pump there's the screen on your inlet of your oil a flare screen on the inlet of your oil float you, you need to valve that off right there's a there should be a service valve right there where you can valve that off and isolate the compressor and then pull that screen. And then you should check the screen on your sender. So anytime you're dealing with an uh, electronic oil fill control, um, you should be able to pull, like as you have the pressure off that compressor, pull those three screens and make sure that you're clean. If you clean on all those things, then, then we can start doing some adjusting. So but the, the way that if you guys, oil is the number one thing that seems to really um, kick our butts we get multiple callbacks on oil and the reason for that being is is because flooding can cause what looks like an, an oil fell situation um, any restriction in the separator can cause that uh, any, any logging in an evaporator can cause that so there's a lot of things that are tied to the oil that will cause an oil fell situation in the compressor and so you need to understand let's I want to talk about best practices on how when we come up on a compressor if you are a guy that hits the magic red button and walks away, then we need to have another talk off site. Do not hit the button and walk away. So the one thing you guys need to do is, is the, the button should be the last thing you push. So the first thing you should do is if you have one compressor off on oil fell, then you should, then you should do some check down, check your contactor, check your oil to see what the oil level is. If you're dealing with a tracks oil system, make sure that that tracks oil uh, there's a screen on those as well. Make sure that you're checking that screen. Make sure that you're checking to make sure that it's feeding. First thing you're gonna do is look at your oil level and you're gonna look at your oil condition, the color, the, the like take a little bit of oil out of the pump and smell it, smell if it's acidic. So do an oil test, take a test all and, and test the acidity in the, in the oil and then start going after clean, checking those screens. So if you have an oil, a, a compressor off on an oil uh, problem and it's your first time out there, then the first thing that you should do is, is isolate that compressor and, and check the screens. Uh, I got a question. 
Yeah. So you said uh, a flooding back case would cause a problem. Do you just check superheat at each individual suction line coming into the header? That's correct. Adjustments? Okay. Yeah, so the best, the easiest, quickest way to check to see if something's coming back rich is you can start clamping those lines. And I usually grab the two or three coldest ones. So if I have multiple circuits coming into that header, usually the one that's not, not the, the, the compressor that's off on oil fell, the circuit's pretty close to that compressor. So if you have, I usually look at the two or three right above it. So, but that's, that necessarily isn't all, the, all true all the time. So the best thing to do is just check the temperature on the back. I just grab it with my hands. You can usually tell which one's coming back to your rich. Uh, if you can't, that's, that's where you start. So when you're dealing with a flooded start or something coming, a lot of times, uh, like on these large coils, like in the POS freezers and coolers at Costco, when they start to flood, when they come out of defrost, sometimes they'll come back. That's why they have that bleed off valve that uh, bleeds off on the suction line for about 15 seconds is to help, help, help uh, bring that pressure back to the, the header and kind of spread the load. But if it's, it still may come back too rich, so that, that's going to be an expansion valve adjustment at the case. Do they sometimes put in a pressure limiting expansion valve or? Um, I, I don't, I don't like them and we don't use them a lot in the supermarket, in the supermarket, uh, space. Okay. So, I mean, they'll use them usually for on smaller systems to help regulate the crank pressure. But I mean, you, sh your valve should shut off based on back pressure uh, of that evaporator. Uh, during the defrost. So if it's just shutting off the suction, suction stop. So as soon as that suction stop stops pulling on the, the back side of that, the, the, the valve should stop feeding at the evaporator eventually. So as pressure builds. Make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. You bet. Multi-compressors, lubrication, multiple compressor share oil requires oil level controls. That's what we're talking about. Oil separators needed. So guys, this is this is a high pressure. See how the side glasses are right on the separator? So the reason why this is high pressure is because what's holding back is you can see right here. I don't know if that's it. It might be. I think this is your oil line right here, and that's your that's your pressure valve right there that drops the pressure going to the crankcase. So this comes in as high pressure, feeds out as high pressure, and then these valves right here drop the pressure that goes to the float. So it looks like a TXV, usually painted black. So that drops that pressure down. So we, the reason why we're dropping pressure into the crankcase is we can't blow oil into the compressor at, you know, 150 to 250 PSI into a, in, into a negative 20 compressor with we'll oil, roll oil all over. So we need to drop that pressure only do about 20 or 30 pounds above what crank pressure is, just enough to so that the oil flows into the crankcase and then the pump either pumps it or if it's a compressor, it just it. Hey, Make sense? Uh, I, I lost you there for a second. There was some music playing I, I, on somebody's thing. Okay, so it just understand which system you're dealing with, guys. If you're dealing with a high pressure or low pressure, you, you when you're doing working on these a lot, you'll you it's really you can just take a look at it and you know which one you're dealing with just by just by the components that are that you see on the rack. So this is your discharge going into your your separator, and then your separator goes in up to the condenser from there. So the separator separates the oil and then the oil sits in that tank. And then if it's a float style, it lifts the float and the float feeds the reservoir. If it's a high pressure, it does it all within the, the separator. So we kind of covered this, locations on the discharge line. Separates oil from the discharge gas, returns oil to the compressor crane case. So one thing I will tell you guys is, again, oil is the biggest, seems to be the largest callback problem that we have. Oil problems can kick people's butts other than some of the newer equipment we're dealing with. But when we're dealing with some of the old DX uh, racks, 
you know, guys seem to struggle with oil. So the biggest thing is, is like, know, know the condition of the oil. Don't be afraid to tell the customer that it needs an oil change. So everybody kind of seems to shy away from that. If you guys have black oil in your system and it doesn't, and it doesn't test well, um, and you're, and it's been broken down for whatever reason. So, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that we let the customer know it's time for an oil change. <laughs> I got another question. Sorry. Uh, as far as when one compressor oil goes black, since they're all tied in together, how much cross contamination is there? It, it, it's the whole system. So if one, if you, it, it should be, it should be, if it's a parallel rack system and you have bad oil in one compressor, you got bad oil in the whole system because it shares all the oil. So if you have to do a rack oil chain, you know, sometimes you, you sometimes you're on those 13 compressor rack systems, you, you may be, you know, 50 to 20 gallons of oil into a rack to, to change all the oil out. So make sure when you guys are changing, you guys should be changing your oil filters a maximum of a year. So there that, this is that little canister right here. So it usually comes off the oil line and goes through the oil filter. So you guys should be dating the top of that filter with a Sharpie. You need to put your initials and date on the top of that oil filter so we know how old it is. That should be being done on your rack PMs. Cool. Just real quick, I, I've never worked on any type of these kind of systems, but okay. isn't there like a machine hourly rate that it keeps track of, runtime, that would be used to change the oil? Yeah, I mean, you can you can look at runtime. The problem is, is like, okay, so you got six compressors on a rack, and compressor one has, you know, 3,000 hours of run, but then, because it's stage one, but then compressor four has, you know, six, 600 hours of run. So here's the, the issue is, is that they're sharing the same oil. So the oil is still flowing and being broken down no matter which compressor uses this. So if you have an oil change, you have to change the oil no matter what. You can't just change it in the compressor because as soon as, you, as soon as you open up the valve to the float, you bring in whatever oil the whole rack is using. So if you, have a, if you test positive in any compressor of acid or breakdown or, or it looks bad or it feels bad, guys, you can put oil between the two. Like when you first change – when you first change oil in a, in a rack, or when you first open a gallon of oil, pour that oil on your fingers and rub it back and forth and you'll feel the viscosity of that oil. And then when you guys get into a burnout situation or you get into a, a high acid situation where you test high, take that oil and put it in your fingers. Your memory will remember that. Like we, you'll see these, you see these senior guys and they'll put oil between their fingers. It's not, obviously it's not a catch all test, but these guys actually can tell by the smell, by the feel and by the color of the oil, that if it's, it's due to be changed. Now I would, I would prefer a test and so would the customer, but I'm just saying, again, it comes down to your senses. The very first thing of part about tech method troubleshooting is to use your senses, you know, feel what good oil feels like, feel what bad oil feels like. And you have different oils. You got POE, you got mineral, you got alkyl benzene. So you have synthetics and you have mineral oil. So make sure you know the difference and, and, and make sure that you test the difference so that you, you, you know, you log that in your memory. Jim, can I add something here real quick? Yeah. Hey, when you guys start an oil change, start it and finish it the same day. Don't do two compressors on one rack and come back the next day to do the rest. That's uh, basically defeating the purpose of an oil change. It's like, it, guys, if you went to your, because it's all tied together, if you went, to, if you went and got changed the oil in your car, the last thing you want them to do is change half the oil because then you're mixing all that bad oil with brand new oil. So whenever you, go, whenever you go into a rack, if you have two or three racks in that, do a rack at a time. If you get the rack done, then you're good for the day. But once you start the rack oil change, you finish the rack oil change that in that session. So you can't start it one day and then to Sean's point, finish it the next day. Cause as soon as you open those valves back up and mix that bad oil with good oil, yes, you might still have a little bit better quality, but now you, you still shorten the life of that oil cycle. So make sure when you're changing, it's all tied together. It's a shared oil system. So when you change it, you need to change it and you need to, and you need to scrub it. The best thing you guys can do is understand that like certain styles of racks, like your super pluses, 
run hotter than some of your other uh, zero zone style racks. And when you're running a turbochet oil system, that oil is running hotter uh, than it does on some of these low pressure systems. So you guys need to understand, like on a super plus rack, I traditionally change that annually or biannually to, to sometimes I change some of these low pressure systems, you know, every three to four years. So, but that, but it doesn't matter. It takes one burnout or one compressor scattering to contaminate that oil or one high uh, condensing temperature situation. As soon as you run that oil too hot in that system for whatever reason, or you have uh, a compressor grenade in that oil, it is contaminated. You have to change the whole rack. Now, typically how long should an oil change take? Now I know it's gonna vary across yeah. different systems and different you know, uh, bank of compressors. Uh, but like, let's say take Costco, maybe an eight to a 13 bank. Yeah. How, how long is the system going to be down? So that way you could tell the customer, Hey, look, you know, to do, be to, down for a while. Well, you can start pumping oil out and still keep things running. It's when you get down to that minimum. So your off time should only be like maybe two, two and a half hours of total of total off time, which you, you should be fine. So everything's a, a temp. If you if you shut everything down and you're dumping the, the separator and you don't and you're scared to run the compressors because now you're dumping, but you can change, you can dump the a, a compressor at a time of oil and that's how you start. But your 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 rack downtime should only be a couple hours tops. So gotcha. your, your total oil change time should be anywhere if you do it right, probably two guys six to eight hours, honestly. So maybe a little bit more depending on the application and what type of oil system you're working with. But if you guys are gonna like, like do a good cleaning of the screens, change your oil filters, change your oil, run it, you know, test it, do everything you should set up and clean up, you're talking, you're talking a good full day for, for a 13 compressor rack. Obviously when you're dealing with a smaller rack like a four to, you know, or three or four compressor rack, it's, you know, you cut that time down quite a bit, but yeah. It's going to, you know, when you, you guys, it's an oil change. You want to make sure you do it right. You want to make sure you're thorough. You want to make sure that you're doing a, a good service. You don't want, you want to get as much of the old oil out of that system as possible. You're always going to have a little bit in there that's logged out in the evaporators and, and flowing throughout the system. But you want to try and get, you know, 80% of new, at least 80% or more of new oil in that system when you do an oil change. Uh Quick, quick uh, question, viscosity, how do you choose that? Is it based on what, it's is it all pretty rack, rack manufacturer. So the manufacturer of the rack will have a, a, this specific oil that it shipped from the factory. We stick with that. When we do a retrofit, the, the, the new oil will be specced in the retrofit. Okay. So I have well, a question. Yep. Now, uh, uh, on them cola compressors, do you send, when you do that, uh, oil change out you also remove that screen at the bottom of that compressor and dump that oil out of there too yep that's the that's the pickup screen yeah that's where all the oil is, is in the crankcase so you want to pull those you want to that's okay, what i so, clean the screen so when you clean the screens like i said there's three screens you guys want to clean so it's the sender the float the pickup so the pickups at the bottom it's usually the hex cap or the two bolt diamond diamond cap on the bottom with the screen inside you're going to pull that screen out you're going to clean that so when you're dealing with um, Carlisle's, they just have a screen in the whole bottom of it. So that one is not pullable. But if you're dealing with a Bitzer or a Copeland, there's a pickup screen on the pump style. So you need to pull that screen out. You need to pull the sender out. There's a scre little screen on the sender. The sender is the, the, the brass part that goes into the pump from the oil fell control. We talked about that uh, in another class. And then you need to pull the screen on the, the inline screen on the flare, flare – uh, nut at the float so make sure all those are clean as well okay okay if you guys are are not familiar with how to do a rack oil change please let us know we have a lot of guys that know how to do them well so we will send we will send someone out to your branch if, if it's something that you but i i don't want you guys to shy away from doing the customer right and changing the oil if you need to because we don't know how get reach out to me Reach out to me. We'll get you support. We'll show you how to do a good oil change and then we'll move on. But it, it's important. You know, lubrication is obviously one of the most important things in these systems. We want to make sure that oil quality is good. It's clean and it's doing, if you guys have a lot of fails. So because oil flows through the whole system, if you have an oil breakdown issue, 
The TXVs use oil to, to move the little metal parts inside of it. All your regulating valves use that oil. That's why the oil flows with the refrigerant. So if you're seeing high fat valve failure, if you're seeing, you know, high compressor failure, you have an oil issue. Your oil is broken down, you need to change it. So I have taken a lot of work from a lot of companies based on the fact that the oil condition was so poor. So first thing I look at when I go and do a new store. Now I know we're talking about rack systems, but on the smaller side of things, which is what I'm seeing more, um, if we do see those TXV failures, should we be changing the oil in those little sealed compressors? Or? No, the, the problem with the sealed systems is, you know, usually they, they consider the fact when you change the compressor that you're changing the oil because, you know, they, they think that like, I think it was 65% was the number I saw was of the oil, more than half the oil is in that crankcase of that compressor on a small system. So if you're seeing, a, you know, uh, some of your scrolls, you'll see a, an oil port in the bottom. You can give it a go if you feel comfortable with it, but most of the time we don't touch the oil unless we change the compressor. The most important thing, guys, is when you change the compressor to make sure you change your filter dryer, make sure that, you know, um, if you had a burnout, that you go up, you go back, you do a high acid filter change, and then you do another uh, another filter change after that. So, if you guys are dealing with oil issues in a small system, it really depends on your uh, your cleanup process through your filter dryers, through your triple evacuation processes, those types of things. Okay. All right. Any other questions, guys? Okay, moving on. So here's the here's that float, Julian, and see that nut at the top, the where you take that hex off. That's where you're going to make your adjustment. And to Sean's point, make sure that it's small and that we don't get on it too hard, or you're going to drop that that float right into the the bottom of that um, canister there. So maintaining case temperatures. The common suck. Any more questions about oil? Like I'm glad that we have a lot of questions. That means we're all dealing with the same struggle. So we got a lot of questions about oil. I think oil is over, you know, very, very uh, under underlooked and underutilized to make sure that we do good oil testing and good oil cleanup. If you guys aren't doing oil testing on your PMs right now on rack systems, regardless if it's in the checklist or not, let's do our customer a favor and let's try and test that oil every six months. Like I said, all it takes is one compressor or one summer of uh, where the coils didn't get washed and we run that head pressure up too high and we've, contaminated, we've broken down the oil. So let's make sure every spring and every fall, we check our oil with the acid kit. So, and I like the, the new Calgon kit. I'm not a big fan of the Sporlin, just, just personal preference, but they both work. So maintaining case temperatures, common suction line for group cases, uh, one EPR valve evaporator pressure regulator is what that stands for per suction line. This is on rack system guys, this is how we make our temperature adjustments. Consistent uh, suction pressure, consistent case temperature. So <clears throat> again, when you guys are making adjustments to EPRs, so when you've got your gauges on that top side of that EPR. So right here, you see this port right here? That's your inlet coming down, that's your back pressure. So you're gonna gauge up right here on your EPR. This is a, this is a, uh, a Parker sport valve. The S in sport stands for suction stop. So this shuts the valve completely down when in defrost. So a couple things about this valve is, on the bottom here is a bypass. So if you guys need to bypass that valve for whatever reason, you can't get it to open enough or you can't get it to feed, you can take that nut off or you're trying to pump the system down. You can take that nut off and you can open that valve into full bypass. So, and it will not regulate. So the second thing is, is if you gauge up to this port right here and you put your gauges on it um, and you make your adjustments over here on the, the, the end of this valve with that um, square nut, just make sure you make eight, no more than an eighth to a quarter inch turn at a time and watch your pressure drop. Again, I watch guys spin these things like a full turn and then drop. And when you're drop, going from warm to cool, you can go pretty quick. But when you're trying to warm up, remember, 
if you if you warm that case up and it doesn't immediately move well the the refer the, the coil's got to warm up before the pressure rises so when you're warming up the case and the way that i always look at it is if you're looking at the back of the valve the same way you turn the screw is the way your gauge is going to move that's how i remember which way to turn it so if i turn it counterclockwise my pressure's going to drop if i turn it clockwise my pressure's going to rise just like it would on my gauges Any questions? This valve is where you make an adjustment on your to your specific circuits on the racks. So there's you do not have a thermostat in the case. This will this will adjust the temperature to the whole lineup. Whatever that circuit's tied. I got a question. Are these are they serviceable as far as like breaking them down, cleaning them? Like let's say you have one sticking or something like that, or do you just change them out? I, you know what, I've had, I've not, I haven't had good luck. I'll let some of the other supermarket techs answer to that. But usually when I split them apart, we're done. Like for whatever reason, they don't seat right. They, they're, they're something that was already scored or out of true inside the valve. Very rarely have I been able to pull it apart and put it back together and have it work. I've, I've, I have had it work in a pinch, but usually, you know, usually when I run into that situation, I'll, I'll float the rack. I'll bypass the valve and float the rack if I have to, to get it through the night. So, but when you guys are dealing with a, uh, a rebuild, you can get a rebuild kit. And, and again, anytime you're dealing with a rebuild kit, you might have something else wrong with that valve. The seats, the seats uh, scored or some debris came passed through there and scored the seat of the actual body of the valve. So um, not, honestly, best practice for me is I just change it. I'm already there. I got to pump down the system. I'm already going to charge a customer a couple hours to do it. The difference between a rebuild kit and a new valve is, is not enough to justify me having to do it twice. I hear that. So oftentimes with these as well, you can leave the welded in body in place and, and uh, just change out all the internals. Yes. The, the one thing I will tell you on that, the caveat on that is when you split the, when you split the rebuild, the top part of that kit and all you have is the brass bottom, please, please examine it. Look at, look at the seat on the bottom of that valve and make sure that there's, there's no minute scores in that because the smallest little nick or the smallest scratch in that valve can cause, can cause issues. So on the, the, I've, had, I've had pretty good success with the Parker valve, which is the picture you're looking at. They're pretty robust. Those PI valves, the PI valves that Sporlin make, we've had a lot of issues with those in the past. Any other comments? Sean Croft or Sean Moore, you market guys, you got anything more to say about that? Uh, pretty much just confirming what you're saying. If you're going to take the time to rebuild that valve uh, and put a gasket kit in it, short of if you're doing a retrofit, um, it's you're in better shape just to go ahead and replace the valve completely. Um, even on the retrofits, when they're just changing out the gaskets uh, because of the smaller molecular structure of the new gas, uh, you run into a few where they start sticking and stuff like that, and you end up having to replace them anyhow. So. Just be mindful of that, especially when you've got a retrofit crew coming through that you may be chasing valves for a while. Yep. I mean, and when you guys are dealing with these, these new refrigerants too, the glide, we keep seeing bigger and bigger glides as they keep coming up with different and different blends. So make sure you understand the, you, the, uh, the changes in your glides. So as you're setting up these regulating valves, it matters for temperature hey jim uh, one thing that i will mention just from the kind of the service manager aspect of it if you're making an adjustment to an epr please document that in your paperwork um, that way especially given the uh, service trade and the history that we're going to have it's yes. going to be a valuable valuable tool so that uh, if adjustments that are made by technician a um, without marking that down Technician B, when he's out there on the weekend, perhaps there was, you know, another issue or uh, technician A didn't do a, a, the sufficient job, that information's there. So please capture that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Sean, I can't tell you. I mean, you guys all remember the day where you saw a notepad paper uh, tied to the, the, the adjustment stem on that valve. 
telling it, telling you the date and the time and the pressure that the guy left the valve at. So now we're a little bit more sophisticated. So please take a picture of it. You guys, you know, take a picture of your gauges with service trade. You can take a picture of your gauge and where it was set and you can tie that right to the ticket and then put it in the description. So the next guy going on site, Jim, with this service trade, is he going to be able to pull up, like, say I went out and made an adjustment and Robert goes back. Is Robert going to be able to pull up my notes on the job? Yep. Yep. The, the cool thing about it, and I've been using it for a week while I've been out running calls, is I can see every all the history on that call for as long as I want to. So when I go into that call, I can actually see all the deficiencies logged and I can see all the history that's been worked on that call. Perfect. Yeah. So we don't have to utilize a paper log book inside the machine room anymore? The best thing that you can tell your guys about service trade guys is documentation, documentation. Take a lot of pictures. I've, I'm taking a ton of pictures. I'm probably logging, you know, 10 to 15 pictures per call just on what I'm seeing, like the condition of overall condition of the rack rooms, the overall condition of the, the machinery, you know, model and serial number tags, just a ton of stuff because, you know, the more we have there, the better for the next guy. I mean, a picture paints a thousand words. It's, it's, it's amazing and how powerful it is that we can take pictures or video. I've taken a lot of video. So if you guys have a, a noise or, or a, a noise you don't understand, video it and load it up into service trade. Hey, Jim, uh, just to point out, um, and also I think it was Sean that was talking down there at St. George, that uh, you're actually, through service trade, you're actually able to upload that picture directly to that asset. Yep. So it's, it's not that a guy's going to have to flip through, you know, 900 pictures to find the one picture of that one case. Uh, if the technician's doing it correctly and he's on that asset, he can add that picture directly to that asset. That anytime anybody pulls up that asset, those pictures are available. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, guys. And it's, it's like any system. It's a garbage in, garbage out. So the more detailed you can teach your guys to be, the more efficient we're going to become over time. So if you can mark the circuit number and you can mark the valve number, you know, and you can tie, tie it to that asset, that circuit, that's what Sean's saying. You can actually tie pictures right to that, right to that valve or right to that compressor, or right to that case. Nice. So, okay. Scott, you on? I see you. So I'm going to turn the time over to Scott guys. Cause we're running about, yeah, we got about 15 more minutes. I want to touch on SR systems because guys struggle with them. And it's this time of year when we're changing seasons where you really need to understand SR um, if you're dealing with some Costco stuff. And it's just good to understand good subcooling and stuff. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott. I'm going to give him control. And then uh, I'm going to flip this, this slide deck. So give me just a second to do all that. You can, can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. So let me let me pull up the the diagram, Scott, for you. Just let me know. Wait, can you everybody see that? Can you see that, Scott? Yep, I see it. Okay. So take it away. Just kind of run us down and, uh, and give us a little background on this, and then uh, run us down on exactly how we're controlling and what we're doing with these types of systems. Okay, so uh, this is a this is an overview slide um, that I made years back for uh, doing some training on this. I don't know if anybody's uh, seen this or or been involved with uh, an SR system or or any charge management system, but um, this is a, a, a sheet that we can print out and uh, and get you guys. It's a really good cheat sheet that just. Uh, highlights all of the components and the attributes of a, an, a system with SR, which is basically um, uh, the perfected uh, uh, Tyler and ViraGuard uh, charge management system. Um, and what, what the charge management system does is um, eliminates the um, surplus uh, refrigerant that would be normally stored in a receiver tank. It essentially is a supermarket system that's a critical charge. Um, uh, it, it's a critical charge system. So the refrigerant, uh, is my mouse visible on, on, your, is it on your screen? I can give you a remote control, Scott. Hold on a second. Yeah, we, I could see it. Uh, 
I think that's Jim's mouse hovering over the compressor. That's not mine. Mine's over on the condenser uh, drain line. So it's gone. Well, any, anyway, while Jim does that, if, if uh, we can get the mouse control, the, the cycle of a, of a or the, uh, the main uh, difference between uh, a critical charge system and a standard uh, receiver system is the liquid from the condenser uh, goes directly from the condenser and drains down and goes immediately to all of the cases. It does not go to a receiver uh, and uh, before it, it pumps out into the uh, cases. Um, and the reason why you typically can't, you don't see that on a, on a system, especially on a large grocery store system is because there's an ambient variable that you have to account for. So the condenser is a fixed size um, and uh, it, it in the winter time, the, the big condenser that sits up there technically is much, much bigger than it needs to be. And uh, in the summertime, it's, it, it is what it needs to be. Um, so you'll need the full, full, full volume, the full surface area of the condenser under hot conditions. But you don't need much of that condenser at all in the winter time uh, when, uh, when it's cold outside. So what we do is we monitor uh, the condensers uh, performance basically by sampling the, uh, the outlet pressure where you see the uh, condenser outlet pressure down here on the outlet of the condenser. And we measure the, uh, the pressure and then the computer then converts that pressure to the saturated uh, condensing temperature. And then we measure the actual uh, temperature of the liquid and compare the physical measured temperature to the calculated saturated temperature. And that yields us our actual condenser's uh, subcool value. So how much farther we've subcooled it beyond its saturated uh, condensing temp. In the summertime, uh, we can only cool it down a few degrees uh, below uh, its saturated because of the amount of heat that's in the air. But in the winter time, when we're down below a saturated uh, condensing temperature, we can let it go as cold as we want. And because we can actually control how much liquid is sitting inside of that condenser, we have free reign to do anything we want with the uh, liquid quality and the conditions of the liquid. So the expansion tank or re refrigerant reservoir, what, would, what normally is used as a uh, receiver, just stores surplus refrigerant. And based on how much pressure is inside of the condenser, we will add or remove refrigerant. This is like a, uh, like a base, basically like a recovery tank. It's a supply of refrigerant when the system needs it, and it's a recovery tank when it has too much in it. And that's all based on the performance of the condenser. It uses the compressors uh, to do all of that, to transfer refrigerant in and out of the system. Um, and we control uh, how much pressure is inside of this tank by adding or removing gas to the top of it by venting, it, venting off pressure in the suction line or adding discharge gas pressure. So that way the, the refrigerant that's in the expansion tank uh, feeds in and out of the system, in, directly in and out of the liquid line Again, we're charging in, in and out of the, the liquid line. Uh, and we have absolute total control over what, the, where, what refrigerant levels are, are going on inside the system. Um, it's, it's a pretty complex uh, program inside, but it's a very simple strategy. Uh, it, it, this is really something that could be an entire, I, I spend entire days on training for just this, uh, this system, but it's a, it's a critical charge system that we can, uh, we can uh, control the uh, saturated condensing temperature perfectly on. Um, the other, another caveat that makes this a very efficient system is the fact that since there's no receiver, we're not, we, we condense 
in the condenser and then go directly to the expansion valves. So our only point of refrigerant expansion and work that the compressors are doing is pushing through the TXVs. On a standard system where you have a receiver, your liquid is produced by the condenser and then drained into the, con into the receiver and the receiver has a big bubble of vapor on top of it. And you have to compress that bubble of vapor before you can push that liquid back out of the receiver to the TXVs. Well, that big vapor uh, bubble on top of the receiver acts as a, uh, as a kind of like a pressure buffer. So it's almost like uh, it's akin to uh, pulling a load, uh, like you're trying to pull a car out of a ditch uh, with a bungee strap as opposed to a chain or a cable. So you have to actually compress the vapor bubble on the receiver tank before you can start pushing liquid out of it. And that's an enormous amount of work, a preload condition that you have to, that the compressors have to do before you actually start seeing that your liquid at your TXVs. So just like pulling a car out of a ditch with a bungee strap, you're going to have to do a lot of work to stretch that bungee until it reaches its stretch point uh, that exceeds the, res the weight of the car to pull it out. And nobody would pull a car out of a ditch with a bungee strap uh, just because it's a, it's a waste of, of energy. You do it with a chain and then every bit of force you uh, pull on the chain, you're going to pull on the car. Uh, you lose a little bit with the weight of the chain and cable, but I, I hope that makes sense as, a, as an analogy. Um, but this is a this is a, this is a, the ultimate way to have total control over your liquids, your liquid quality. Um, you can monitor and, and track very closely the amount of refrigerant in the system. If you start getting low um, on refrigerant, um, there's just an enormous amount of serviceability and, and trackability, traceability on uh, on performance with a system like this. Um, you're, you're monitoring your liquid levels, your subcooling of the condenser. So you can diagnose uh, when you got condenser fan motors are starting to fail because the, the drop leg temps won't jive with the ambient temps and things. So it's, it's a pretty complex system that, uh, that, that we could actually spend and we will spend, uh, we will do specific training sessions on this at later dates, but it'll be a specific focus training. Yeah, so with that, with that kind of high-level um, review, if you guys want a copy of this, just reach out to me. I'll send you the PDF file so you can print it off for your guys. I, pr I, pr I printed it off a couple times here in Salt Lake because we have a bunch of these systems in our area. Um, is, that, is that, Jim, is that the workbook that has all the stages, the description of the stages? No, so if you have that, why don't you send that to me? So okay, that I'll get that out. Yeah, there's a, there's a, the, I made a document that shows each – uh, each phase of this operation and the um, what's going on. So it explains that this page right here was actually a, a, a condensed uh, version that I made specific to be able to print out on a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper. Um, so yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll get that over to you here uh, right after the meeting's done. Okay guys, I'm already getting a couple texts from you guys about you guys want it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to send it out to all the branches, to the managers so that you guys can distribute it. And so it's a good thing to touch on. It's just, it's good refrigeration concept. Um, you know, it's actually a very dynamic control system, which, which uh, is very energy efficient and um, refrigerant usage efficient. So heat transfer efficient. So we need to, we need to kind of, you know, if you don't know it, take some time and study it. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot you can research about what, what they've done here. It's pretty awesome stuff. So I, I, I know that we're making some, some adjustments or some guys have wanted to make some adjustments now with us getting cooler. Um, and so I just want to make sure that everybody has a, a, at least a little bit of a grasp. I, I, I know that in 10 minutes we can't have a full understanding, but at least now you have a diagram of kind of what the system's trying to do. Do you have any other questions? Oh, you stumped them, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys, that's uh, we're we're coming up on five on the hour. Um, any other questions on what we reviewed today? So we got a that was a a sixty slide deck. So we'll cover that the next half of it next next time we meet. Maybe on our off week, I'll I'll do a class anyways, and we'll cover the other half of that 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 slide deck. So. 
Um, that's it for uh, um, parallels. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Oh, uh, yeah. Welcome, Jim. We'll talk to you here in a bit. All right. All right. We'll see you.